Welcome to Talk 12 in our series on how God speaks to us. In recent talks, we've been considering how God speaks to us through our parents and through other Christians. We now turn our attention to how God speaks to us through the preaching of his word and by those he has called and gifted to do so. We've already seen that God expects all Christians to spread the good news of the gospel to those with whom they come in contact. The gift of the Holy Spirit is available to all Christians and is empowering, enables us all to be witnesses for Christ. In Ephesians 4 verses 11 and 12, however, we read how Christ has given to the church apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors and teachers to equip God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. I've written at length on each of these roles in my book, Bodybuilders, so I won't be going into great detail here. It'll be enough for us to remind ourselves that one of the chief ways that God has chosen to speak to us is through his servants. Of course, God speaks to us individually as we read our Bibles, but that by no means does away with the need for the teaching of God's word through those to whom he has entrusted our spiritual welfare. In Acts 20, the Apostle Paul is on his way to Jerusalem and at Miletus he calls for the elders of the church to come and see him, verse 17. He knows that none of them will ever see him again, verse 25, and he wants to encourage them and pray with them one last time. In verse 28 he tells them to keep watch over yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the flock, the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. Notice that in verse 17, these people are referred to as elders. In this verse, verse 28, they're called overseers and shepherds. And it's clear from this and from passages like 1 Peter 5, 1 to 5 and Titus 1 5 to 7 that in the New Testament elders overseers and shepherds or pastors are interchangeable terms referring to the same role two their responsibility is to protect and care for the flock God's people the church from wolves false teachers who distort the truth, Acts 20 verse 29 and 1 Peter 5 2. Thirdly, they must encourage others by sound teaching and refute those who oppose it, Titus 1 9. And finally, they are ultimately accountable to Christ who is the chief shepherd of the flock, 1 Peter 5 5. Since God has given such a serious responsibility to those who are the shepherds of his sheep, it follows that his people are to pay attention to the teaching and advice given by church leaders. Now, I can't say in all honesty that I have always done so. In fact, I remember that as a teenager, I sometimes argued publicly with our Baptist pastor, for which I wrote and apologised a few years later after I was baptised with the Holy Spirit. But I'm glad to say that down through the years, again and again, God has spoken to me and guided me through the teaching and advice of pastors and other preachers. And I'm sure the same is true for you too. Perhaps the best example of this in my own experience is how the Lord called me to full-time ministry. Mamhead Park is a country mansion built regardless of cost in the 19th century, set in hundreds of acres of beautiful countryside with views going down to the sea at Lyme Bay on the south coast of England, 
in the 1950s, it was used by the Baptist as a centre for, for retreats and conferences. It was also used in the school holidays for summer schools for young people. It was at one of these that God spoke to me and showed me that I was to be a minister. Now, there is a sense, of course, in which all God's people are ministers, but I'm using the word here in the sense in which I understood it back then, and as many churches still understand it today, to mean the full-time pastor of a local church. It was at the end of one of these evening sessions. The preacher had just finished his message, and the Reverend Cyril Rusbridge, who had been leading the meeting, was expected to close in prayer. But before he did so, he said, Before we close in prayer, I just feel the Lord wants me to tell you how he called me to the ministry. Then he took just a few minutes sharing with us how this had happened. It was nothing like Paul's experience on the Damascus Road. I don't remember the details, but by the time he had finished, I felt sure that God was calling me to the ministry too. This was confirmed by Kate, one of the young people from our youth group, who said to me as soon as the meeting ended, David, do you know now what the Lord wants you to do with your life? The answer was yes. I was absolutely sure. I wrote home to my parents telling them what had happened. When I got home, they told me how pleased they were and how when the doctor had told them that they were unlikely to have any children, they had prayed that the Lord would give them a son who would have an international ministry. And shortly after that, I came along. I was 16 at the time and in the middle of preparing for A-levels at school when I felt this call to the ministry. I spoke to our pastor, the Reverend Leslie Moxon, and asked his advice as to my next steps now that the Lord had called me to the ministry. He suggested that I should start to attend the midweek prayer and Bible study meeting and this I was happy to do. But there was just one problem time. Students at Brentwood School, where I attended, had lessons for six days every week and were expected to do two to three hours prep or homework every evening. Sunday was the only day we were not at school and on Sundays I was already attending Boys Brigade Bible class at 10 a.m the morning church service at 11am, teenage Bible class at 3pm, youth discussion group at 4.30pm, the evening service at 6.30pm, and an after church sing song from 8 to 9pm. I also attended Boys Brigade, Young People's Fellowship, and the Church Youth Club three evenings every week. Could I still fit in an extra meeting without it affecting my studies at school? My history teacher clearly thought not. About two months before I was due to take my A-level exams, he said to me in front of the whole class, Quite honestly, pets, unless you work harder, you're going to fail your A-levels. To which I replied, well, you see, sir, I believe that God has called me to the ministry and that it's important that I attend the meetings at our church. And I explained to him how busy I was. Then I added, Actually, sir, I do believe that if I put God first and if he wants me to pass my A-levels, he won't let me down. To which he replied, Pets, I respect your convictions, but I can't say that I agree with you. 
As a result of that conversation, I did try to work harder. But I also continued to attend all the meetings at the church, including the midweek Bible study recommended by my pastor. When the A-level results were published, to the surprise of my teacher, I had received a comfortable pass in all subjects, including history. And to my surprise, I was shortly afterwards awarded a prestigious Heseltine exhibition to study at Brasenose College, Oxford. I give God all the glory for this. I'd followed my pastor's advice and had tried to put God first. I had honoured the Lord in front of my teacher and fellow students, and the Lord did not fail me. I have to say, there were fellow students who had taken the same exam as I had for the Heseltine exhibition, who in their A-levels had done better than I had, in fact, who consistently had done better academically at school. And yet, none of them received the award of the exhibition. I believe that was God. A few years later, after graduating from Oxford, I was pastoring a small church in Colchester. The church funds were insufficient to pay me full time, so I was teaching religious education in a local secondary school to provide for the needs of our young family. This was clearly part of the Lord's plan, as during the years I was teaching there, dozens of teacher, teenagers came to our church and made decisions for Christ. I remember one occasion where there were 41 decisions for Christ in just one meeting. But I knew that the Lord had called me to full-time ministry and that eventually the time would come for me to give up my teaching job. The question was, when? The answer came during the Assemblies of God annual conference held in Clacton in May 1966. I wasn't able to attend during the day as it coincided with the school summer term and I was teaching. But I was able to go in the evenings as Clacton isn't very far from Colchester. The preacher on the first night was Pastor Eddie Durham. He began by talking about how, in time past, if a man wanted to challenge another to a duel, he would throw down a gauntlet in front of him. The challenge was accepted by the other man picking up the gauntlet. Pastor Durham then produced a motorcycle gauntlet and threw it on the floor before the congregation, saying, I challenge young men in the meeting to give themselves full time to the ministry. Oh, I remember thinking, that's all very well. I love to be full time in the ministry, but it simply isn't possible financially. My teaching job was the only means of income. But then I added, but Lord, if that's what you want me to do, I'll do it. But you'll have to make it very clear by the end of the week. The reason I said this was that I was contractually obliged to submit my resignation to the school where I was teaching by the end of May if I was not going to return for the beginning of the new term in September. God had just a week to let me know what he wanted me to do. And he did. Night after night, I went back to those meetings, having told no one but Eileen what I had prayed. And each night, in one way or another, God spoke to me, confirming that I was to give up my teaching job. A particular highlight was the preaching of Thomas F. Zimmerman, the General Superintendent of Assemblies of God in the USA, who was one of the guest preachers at the conference. What made it particularly significant 
was the fact that it was the night of my ordination where hands were laid on me in recognition of the ministry God had given me. And incidentally, I was pleased to discover that the two senior ministers who laid hands on me and prayed for me were John Nelson Parr and Howard Carter, both of whom were key pioneers in the history of the Pentecostal movement. Zimmerman's message was based on 1 Kings 17 and 18 and the story of Elijah. I was reminded that if we follow God's plan, we will know his provision and his power. By the end of the week, Eileen and I were fully convinced that God's plan was that I should give up my teaching job and trust him to provide for our needs. And so, first thing, on Monday morning, I went to the head teacher, who incidentally was an atheist, and handed in my resignation. When asked for a reason, I could only reply, Well, sir, this may sound a little strange, but God has told me to. Strange telling a man who doesn't believe in God that God has told you something. But if that's what God has done, you tell it to atheist or anybody else. One little interesting addition to that story is that Pastor Eddie Durham became a member of the Board of Governors at Mattersea Bible College when I was the principal and was a great of great assistance to us uh, during that particular time. As a result, when he died, I went to attend his funeral and was asked to say a few words. And I told this story of how he had thrown down a motorcycle gauntlet and I had accepted the challenge. His plan in my life, his part in God's plan for my life was certainly very significant. And shortly after that, through the post, a parcel arrived from Eddie Durham's son. It was the gauntlet that Eddie had thrown down to challenge young men to give themselves to the ministry. So, God certainly speaks through pastors and preachers, and sometimes their preaching is more than just teaching or giving advice. It can have a real prophetic edge. That should be the case for all who have the responsibility of ministering God's word. But there are some who are specially gifted as prophets and it's to the ministry of prophets that we'll be giving attention in our next talk. God bless you.